So today I'm going to talk to you about on success, failure, resilience, and pushing the limits. The actual full title of my talk is on success, failure, resilience, pushing the limits. What I learned from Navy SEALs, sociopaths, martial arts, medicine, astronauts, and my father. But that was too long to put in the program. <laughs> I guess it can be said that in my time here on this planet, I've been very, very fortunate. At various times in my life, I've been fortunate enough to be a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, work at NASA and the European Space Agency, walk the runway as a model, practice as a surgeon in neurosurgery and pr primary care, and also train as a citizen scientist astronaut candidate. Unfortunately, the PowerPoint's not working, so you'll just have to listen closely to what I have to say to you today. So I've been very, very lucky, and it can be said that I've had a very good run so far on this planet. And I've learned a lot through my successes in my time here. But never have I learned as much as the times of when I failed, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. A little over a year ago now, I was undergoing a rough time. I was leaving my career in neurosurgery, and this was something I had wanted since I was 15. And so, as I left neurosurgery for a variety of reasons, internal, external, and related to other life goals, I felt like I had lost all sense of perspective. And to give you an idea of how much I had internalized this role, if, when I looked back to my yearbook, from high school when I was 17, it was peppered with messages saying, I wish you well on your path towards becoming a brain surgeon and my personal favorite. If I ever see a two-for-one ice pick lobotomy deal, I'll know it's you. <laughs> and so I lost my sense of perspective. I felt like a failure, and I lost my sense of self-worth. And there were times when I would look in the mirror and say, I am an absolute disgrace. Except it was a little bit more colorful than that, but you get the idea. And to say those kinds of things to yourself leaves scars on your psyche that extend far beyond the moment in which you utter them and take a long time to heal. What I needed to do was I needed to learn about resilience and dealing with failure. Resilience. This was a word that was often uttered to me by the postgraduate medical education equivalent of a high school guidance counselor who would often sit down with me as I tried to navigate what I felt was the end of the world. And I would say to her, neurosurgery is my life. My job is my life. And she would nod understandingly, comprehendingly, and say, yes, but that's a little bit sad. And and what, she, what I needed to do was learn resilience, but at the time, I didn't see it, and I didn't know how to move on. In fact, I felt like I was 30, and I was divorced, and accordingly, I went through this post-breakup kind of phase that involved sweatpants, movie marathons, and Ben and & Jerry's. Except this being 2015, it was instead Netflix, yogurt, and chocolate chips, and yoga pants. <laughs> and for those of you who haven't yet discovered the magic that is Arrested Development, I highly recommended it. <laughs> And so as I set out to gain perspective and learned about what else there was in the whole wide world of medicine, I did the rational thing. I rotated through forensic psychiatry and sat in on group therapy with antisocial personality disorder types who were also convicted felons. <laughs> I want to be clear, I was an observer, not a participant. But if ever you want a sense of where your life problems truly lie in the grand scheme of things, I highly recommend it. And during my time rotating through psychiatry, I also had the privilege and honor in sitting in on mindfulness group therapy with mental health patients at various ends of the spectrum of treatment. And they say that you will learn something from everyone that you meet. And nowhere did it become more clear than here. Because here I met a patient, we'll call him James. And for everything that he had suffered in his life and everything he had dealt with, both in terms of a broken home, violent past, abusive father, antisocial personality type, drug abuse, homelessness, and multiple convictions. From him, he was a superness, superstar when it came to practicing mindfulness. And whatever else had gone wrong in his life, this individual had it down to an art, practicing the art of detachment. It's like I'm taking a break from James right now, is what he told us. And from him, from this individual that had been dismissed at various points in his life, who had hit rock bottom and been called a vagabond, a druggie, a criminal, and a never-do-well. I learned that mindfulness 
is forgetting the anxiety of what is to come in the future and forgetting the worries of the past and focusing on the present and using that detachment to give yourself a sense of perspective and deal with whatever it is that is coming in your life, be it negative emotion or stress or chaos or otherwise. And after my time in psychiatry, I did the next most reasonable thing. I rotated in primary care on a military base. Military life and ethos and culture is one that has long since fascinated me, and it is here that I met an individual who was undertaking to go JTF candidacy training. And for those of you who don't know, JTF is the Canadian equivalent of SEAL Team 6. And it was here that I learned that the special operations world goes far above and beyond what we see in Call of Duty and Medal of Honor video games. These are people for whom duty and service is life, who will push, push, push to the ends of their limits. And when they have reached those limits, they will push even harder. And there I thought, someone gets it. And this is who I want to get back to being. And so I set out to learn everything I could about the JTF, except they're like ninjas, they're like ghosts. You can't find anything about them. <laughs> but their American counterparts, the US Navy SEALs, are very well studied, and the literature on them is abundant. And so in a phase that I know fondly refer to as hashtag Navy SEAL therapy, I set about getting my hands on every article, novel, book, and podcast related to their training and tried to incorporate that into my own physical training and my own life. They say that the costs of training to be a Navy SEAL is high, up to $500,000 in financial terms. And in a vocation that calls for life and death and destruction and violence as a daily part of the job, you want to, create, you want to select the best of the best. And in Bud School, the Navy SEAL candidate training attrition rates can go up to 80%. And these uh, gentlemen, these men, these candidates have to undergo severe physical training, mental duress, and a period known as Hell Week, where they have to face combat simulation and live on virtually no sleep. And the research shows that when it comes to predicting who will be most successful in times in passing buds, it doesn't come down to who is the fastest or the strongest or the most aggressive. It comes down to resilience. Because resilience is equally important in times of failure and in times of success. And resilience can be broken down, the research shows, into four components. It comes down to setting goals for yourself and then taking small steps to reach those goals. It takes imbuing yourself with positive self-talk, telling yourself that you've got this. It comes down to mental rehearsal for both the best and the worst case scenarios. And it comes down to impulse control. That is, having your brain tell yourself that you can go on when your body just wants to quit. And somewhere through this minorly obsessive phase, I actually happened to meet an active duty Navy SEAL. And he embodied all four of these characteristics. And I wanted to know what made him tick. So when he asked me to join him at a martial arts training camp in Southeast Asia where we would train Muay Thai kickboxing for several hours a day, I did the logical thing and said yes. And it wasn't until I got there that I realized how out of my league I was. Because it was me, and it was local Muay Thai fighters, and semi-pro MMA fighters, and military veterans from across the world. And to give you an idea of what our training schedule was like, we would get up in the mornings, walk one mile to the gym, train Muay Thai one-on-one -on -one for two hours, crank out 100 sit-ups, swim 10 laps in the pool, walk one mile back in 34 degrees Celsius heat, and do the same again in the afternoon. And it was awesome. And I thought that my 15 years of Taekwondo training and two months of Muay Thai would prepare me for this, but I was wrong. And I also learned a great deal about into what it took to learn and dissect my own technique. Because as much as my Taekwondo had helped me, I also had to spend a good deal of time learning, unlearning my Taekwondo technique. I had to take my half-facing Taekwondo stance, turn it into full-facing, widen my stance, straighten my legs, keep my temples guarded by my fists, and make what was deemed in Taekwondo a fatal error, leave my floating ribs open. And I spent an entire day and a half merely perfecting this stance. And I also learned a good thing or two about humility. I learned, because near the end of my training, my, lead, my instructor leaned in close to me and he said, did you actually practice Muay Thai before this? I couldn't tell. 
And I learned what, about the value of per perseverance and endurance and checking your ego at the door. Because despite having been a total rookie, I would, was one of the few who consistently trained twice a day. And oftentimes after finishing my two hour one-on-one -on -one training session, I would go over to the heavy bags to reinforce what I'd learned. And the instructors would often interrupt their own training and teaching to come over to offer encouragement, advice, and corrections. They didn't care that I was a girl or a total rookie or even had little string pole beanie arms. They cared about making me better. And as for the Navy SEAL, I learned firsthand what resilience was. Because this was someone who not just embodied resilience, who had not just passed Bud's candidate school, but he was in an active duty combat and in the heat of battle suffered a pattern of injury that was so severe and so devastating it would have rendered the rest of us useless in a pile of self-pity, PTSD and chronic pain for the rest of our days. But what did he do? He rehabbed, he retrained, and he repassed SEAL qualifi qualification training. This was an individual who had experienced the worst possible day in the pool, and he got in, right back in. I had wanted to learn about resilience, and here I met the most resilient man on the planet. And what I learned from him is beautifully summed up by a quote that can be found on the walls of the Taekwondo Dojang in my gym. Fall down seven times and rise up eight. And what I also learned from a different quote from my time in Thailand was that was, was posted there on the walls of that gym. And it said, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to go on that counts. And I learned how far perseverance and endurance will take you. And this is something that we try to instill in every single white belt that comes to our club, whether they be six or 60, as two of the fundamental tenets of Taekwondo, perseverance and indomitable spirit. But how do we build it? Part of it comes down to learning and mastering the art of reframing. Reframing. It means not, not taking something like a criticism or a failure as a personal defeat or an insult, but as an opportunity to make yourself better. And in my time on this planet, nowhere have I met anyone who has mastered this art more than my own father. My dad is actually a smart man, despite, despite the fact that I don't always act like it. And normally I roll my eyes at his various dadisms, but once in a while one of his little nuggets of wisdom will slip past my filter and be stored away for later use. And I remember that we, my father and I once, we were having an argument and I lost my temper and I snapped at him. And my father, what did he do? My dad, he didn't shake his head in disappointment, he didn't get angry back, he didn't demand an apology. My dad, he thanked me for getting mad at him. And this blew my mind. I'm glad he said that you got angry at me because it means that you didn't have an outlet for your anger before and you have one now. Another time, my father and I, we were driving along from the construction zone on Shira Park Fui to the construction zone in Jasper Avenue, taking the construction zone on 82nd Street to get there, me complaining about the construction zones bitterly along the way. And my dad, with his Jedi-like prowess at reframing, said this instead. He said, what would it mean if the roadways were clear? Yes, we would get to where we're going faster, but it would also reflect that we had neither the economy or the investment to invest in our own infrastructure. My dad, the eternal optimist, had done the impossible and made me grateful for construction zones. <laughs> hand in hand with reframing comes gratitude. And nowhere have I learned to be grateful more than through my time in medicine. Because it is through my time in medicine that I've learned that things like trauma and violence and motor vehicle accidents and cancer and brain aneurysms have the power to paralyze and kill and change your life in an instant. I was once dragged along to a very introductory level yoga class with my parents. And one of our exercises consisted of wiggling our toes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for five minutes. And it was mind-numbing, it was boring, and it was endless. 
and then all of a sudden, I flash back to the first week of my residency when we admitted a man my age who had been in a motorcycle accident, and despite having done all the right things, despite having gone the speed limit, having worn a motorcycle helmet, helmet and having worn full personal protective gear, he was now a paraplegic. And suddenly it was the best feeling in the world just to be able to wiggle my toes. And what I learned is that gratitude and reframing are very important tools in resilience and in practicing resilience. And that resilience will be there to help you when you, whether you're trying to survive, bounce back, or even excel. Resilience is equally critical in times of failure and times of success. And as my time with you, and what I also learned about gratitude is this. No matter what your circumstances, you always, always, always have something to be grateful for. Because if you have the ability to complain, you have the ability to be grateful. And if you have the ability to be grateful, it means you can get up and try and try again, because it means that you are alive. And what I also want to leave you with here as I leave you today is that we won't always succeed in life. And sometimes we will fail, and we will fail hard. But I also, and we will experience heartbreak. But I also believe that if we're not experiencing heartbreak, we're not doing it right. And I believe that pain and the pain of failure can be a beautiful teacher. Because just like physical pain, it is through pain that we learn, that we understand the damage that we do to our bodies, our skin, our bones, and our muscle tissue. And the, pain, the emotional pain of failure is equally a powerful teacher. And in experiencing that pain, we know not to repeat that sequence of events when we're faced with that event in secret future circumstances. The other powerful lesson is another one that I've learned from my father. There are no guarantees in life. You can't always control your external circumstances, and you can't always control the actions of others. But you can absolutely, 100%, always control your own thoughts and actions. And when you're faced with times of crisis and chaos, you either stress about it or you don't. It'll either work out or it won't. And if, you're not, if it's not working out, it's time to go back to the drawing board and re come up with a new plan of action. And finally, I learned that when you're at rock bottom, sometimes the hardest but absolute bravest thing you can do is reach out and ask for help. So when you're faced with times of adversity and times of chaos and times of crisis, there's a way to be hard on yourself in a way that is productive and a way that is destructive. And when chaos strikes, you can say, why? Why me? Why now? Why did this happen? Or you can take that failure and you can own it. And you can be surgical about it and you can dissect your mistakes and use it as an excuse to get better. And so when I started out this talk off today, I told, I told you I wanted to tell you about the lessons I've learned and the places I've been. And I want to end with my time telling you where I'm going next. A few months ago, I was giving a keynote on career day at a local high school, and I finished telling the students about my journey through medicine, entrepreneurship, modeling, and space. And at the end of it, one of the students, he, wrote, he stuck up his hand and he said, how does it feel to be winning at life? And at the time, I laughed to myself and thought, if only you knew the lessons I'd learned to get here. Instead, I looked at him and I said, I feel like I'm just getting started. A few years before that, I was sitting with a friend and telling him my, my ambitions to become an astronaut, a CEO, and a brain surgeon. And my friend, he didn't laugh at me. He said, there's no reason you can't be all three. And had this man been anyone other other than former fighter pilot, astronaut, International Space Station commander, recording artist, and author Chris Hadfield, I would have told him he was crazy. <laughs> so I started this presentation with showing you pictures from my high school yearbook from when I was 17, wishing me well on my path to becoming a brain surgeon. And 10 years after the fact, for a short number of years, I was honored enough and I was privileged enough to operate on people's brains. And they were some of the hardest years and the longest days of my life, but they were also some of the best days of my life. But I also want to share with you pictures from my, high, from my medical graduation yearbook when I was 27. And if you can decipher the doctor writing that's shown up there, you can see pictures that say, 
Please take me with you when you go to space. And I look forward to seeing you on the Mars landing on CNN. So where am I today? I'm currently training as a citizen scientist astronaut candidate with Project Possum and Project Phenom. And at the same time, I have been selected as a prime crew member with Project Poseidon, which, as you heard, is a mission to further our knowledge of ocean exploration and underwater science, and will take place in, a rec in an attempt to break the world record for 100 days spent consecutive under the sea in a research facility off the coast of Florida starting in 2018. I finished my medical training this year, and at the same time, I'm training with Team Canada to attend the Taekwondo Open Worlds in Hungary later this year. So where will I be at the next 10-year plan when I'm 37? What yearbook will I have and what will it say? I'm not sure, but I look forward to it. And all I know is this. Lives are long and full of surprises. Thank you.